It's my turn to say good morning to you all, even though there's not much of it left. My sermon title is um, Eternal Life, God's Promised Gift. So what about this universal gift we are all blessed with, that we all partake of and begin with the moment we are born into this world? As you have all rightly guessed, it's the gift of life, isn't it? And even though many take it for granted, most who are fit and healthy would never trade the life experience for anything else, anything different. Many others who are at death's door still want that extra day, week, month or year of life that we term as God's precious ongoing gift to the human race. Yet sadly, old age, health and other depressing problems can cause some to feel that life becomes no longer worth living and take the easy way out. Many who take their own lives had acquired fame, status, wealth, positions, etc., etc., but had no desire to live on and complete life's journey. So sad because it was never the Creator's intention for humanity to have less of life than he had programmed our bodies to enjoy. Even though sin and its originator had a multiplicity of ways to disrupt our existence, even that of the most fervent follower of Jesus Christ. So what is life? It's that period of years or time or existence between our birth and our departure or death. That dreaded word the non-Christian person has to grapple with if he has no future plan beyond this life. At creation, Jesus infused the capability of eternal life into Adam and Eve's perfect bodies. Their progeny thereafter would also enjoy the intrigue of living forever and their children and so on. The development of talents, gifts or abilities would be ever ongoing and would never be termed as a lifetime achievement because there would never be any time frame associated with any interest or project embarked upon. And there wouldn't have to be when one had an eternity that stretched ahead forever. I won't go into how God's perfect plan for you and I became unstuck. The fact is though, that it did. And thereafter the emerging human race had to deal with a new ongoing disease by the name of sin. It was ultra insidious and was a snare to every individual who was to be born thereafter, barring one. The creator would be this exception, i.e. Jesus Christ. As God, he would institute a sacrificial system so that the now fallen race would have a way of regular escape from sin and in faith still be able to be reconciled to God the Father. In conjunction with this amazing facility, a more personal plan was promised at a later date. While the initial provision entailed the death of an animal with its shed blood offered up in faith by a priest on behalf of the one who had erred, the promise following creation was that at this later date, God the Father would send his own son, born of a woman, and being prepared to offer up his body once and for all, 
in place of the shed blood of animals. And so it was in the beginning, life eternal, never ending. Disobedience and sin arrived though. And the Creator had no choice but to thereafter place a limit on how long mankind would be permitted to live which would be, in some cases, upwards of a thousand years. But with sin now making inroads into the expanded human race, God thought it appropriate to cut this number down to a mere 120 years. However, the Creator was once more unhappy with mankind's continuing sinful behaviour it brought about a further reduction in the lifespan of the human race. From upwards of a thousand years down to 120 years. Yet his days or years shall be 120, God's word reads. And finally to three score years and ten. A new paltry period of a lifetime, you would all have to agree, as compared to the other previous limits God had put in place. While some get a bit more than 70 years through surgery and medication, many don't even reach this figure. And on a personal note, I sincerely believe our great God has given me an extension of life and permitted me, so far, to still carry on past the 80 year mark. So I am naturally most grateful for all these extra years past the biblical time frame for humans. And I believe all others who pass the 70 year mark should likewise be thankful. Jesus said, for I am come that you might have life and it, that you might have it more abundantly. To know Jesus Christ, friends, is to enjoy the more abundant life here and now, no matter the circumstances. Yet there was even much more meaning built into this statement, for he wasn't just referring to this present life experience, rather, it also took in his promise of the restoration of eternal life. First with the thousand year heavenly period to be enjoyed with the heavenly host and thereafter returning to this planet with Jesus Christ to build our new homes. The total devastation of this world following Jesus' second return had been attended to with God totally obliterating the past history of the earth with fire and restoring its surface to Edenic wonderment. The abundant life takes in all of our relationship association with Jesus Christ and what he has planned and made possible to all who love and have committed their lives to him for eternity never forgetting the immeasurable cost associated with the fulfilment of all of God's promises in respect of our hereafter. All put together in his desire for his sons and daughters to once more live in eternal bliss as was his original plan. For God so loved the world, or those he created after the likeness of his own image, that he gave or gifted his only son Jesus, that whosoever would love and believe in him should not perish eternally, but rather in due course be offered instead the chance of everlasting life. But before the fulfilment of God's amazing future plan for us, we are all obliged to live out this present life to his satisfaction, are we not? So let's bring our thoughts back to life 
this life or gift the Creator has blessed us all with. This miracle gift, loaded with numerous possibilities, and as well sufficient time or years to fulfil many of these possibilities that appeal to us individually. Anyway, let's see if we can work our way through some of the phases of this life, seeing it's the one we all know something about. For us older ones, most of us can at least remember some specific things or instances we were associated with or involved in. And as youngsters, we naturally didn't question all that was told to us. I bring to mind S-A-N-T-A, -A, an evergreen hoax for most children to look forward to when Christmas comes around each year. That is until we became a little older and realised we were being fooled. Again, for instance, I remember once in Ashburton racing across the fields to find a pot of gold at the end of a rainbow. I was told it would be there for the taking. Someone had most certainly taken advantage of my young age. I was never to find that gold. However, many other interests in life turned out to be far better than that pot of gold. Further down the track and beginning to emerge as a teenager, a faithful mother gathered her five sons around her and set out to introduce them to Christianity. I was the second of these five boys. A little later I discovered what made Christians tick. Jesus was that discovery. And that living pot of gold turned out to be, for me, the best that was ever minted. For a start, that relationship was somewhat at arm's length. But in the ensuing years, it was to become, and still is, that relationship that has no ending to its development and never will in this life. So life moves on, never stops still. Teenage years to young adult years and all the associated excitement one can enjoy and pack into life during those times. With education, that necessary ingredient to help set us up for our livelihood. Like the text in James states though, it doesn't last for long. <clears throat> it reads, for what is your life? Answer. It is even likened to a vapour or a cloud that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. So in God's sight, it's only really a little window of time that gives us a small taste of what we can expect the next time round. When we are gifted eternal life, made possible and promised by Jesus Christ, so again, as we have discovered, life never stands still. We mature and kiss goodbye the prime years of our lives. All types of interests begin to attract us. For most, there are years of married life ahead and family involvement. Children, hobbies, holidays, church life, adventure, successes, and failures, etc., etc. It's ever ongoing and is the re as is the requirement to keep earning sufficient funds to sustain oneself or family. But these years also slip by at a fast clip. And before long, the three score and ten years allotment of life looms up fast on the horizon and a once healthy body begins to develop wear and tear problems. Finally, it can be 
The dreaded rest home situation, no one in their right mind likes to contemplate. Then as the text puts it, we finally vanish away. Many who were wise enough to anchor their lives and trust in Jesus Christ will live again and be resurrected at his return to begin eternal life according to God's promise and plan. So there we have it for what it's worth, the very briefest outline of this universal gift of life. God's blessed gift to his human family. However, let's also have a brief look at what the Christian person can be assured of. Repeat, assured of, following the completion of this life, the one we all know something about. And the one that is likened to a testing period of our fitness to join the Godhead in heaven following Jesus' return. This actual return of Jesus Christ to our planet heralds the beginning of everlasting life. But I repeat, it's only the beginning. The event in itself will be the most spectacular this world will ever witness, being well beyond human imagination. We can only ever try. So let's do that for a few minutes. The atmosphere above the planet is ablaze with colour or radiance. And the brightness is such that only those who had prepared for the occasion will be able to tolerate the brightness of the assembly that emanates from the heavenly host. The centrepiece, Jesus Christ, glowing even many times brighter. For those able to look into all this glory and to note the central figure sitting on a dazzling throne, there comes a shout of acclamation. Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him, and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Meanwhile, the trumpet is blasting. Myriads of the heavenly host have discontinued their descent from heaven and are suspended in space above planet Earth. The trumpet sounding comes to a halt as heaven's choir bursts into a triumphant anthem. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb could be the theme of this glorious music, while heaven's instrumentalists join in to help swell out and add to the luster of God's fanfare. While all this magnificence, magnificence is taking place in space above planet Earth, something phenomenal is happening below on the surface of the earth. And it too is equally dramatic, but in a different way. Graves or other resting places of the saints begin to burst open to release their captives of death. And along with the still living sons and daughters of God, begin to gently ascend into the heavens to join the celestial throng. God had newly clothed each one with a sinless garb and immortality to match. The record from Paul's writings states, made like unto his glorious body at his Jesus appearing. There's a little time and space set aside for reunions to take place. Loved ones and friends embrace and are told to ready themselves for the journey to heaven. The angelic host and the redeemed from all the past ages comprise this vast company now departing for heaven. A backward glance at the smouldering earth below is a sad and sorry sight. 
all of its remaining life had been burned up from the brightness of Jesus' second advent. I will come again and receive you unto myself, but where I am in heaven, there will ye also be. The glorious part one phase of the promise, promise had been faithfully fulfilled. It now seems the old smouldering earth is beginning to diminish in size as a gigantic force continues to propel the now innumerable company out into space. Very soon, planet Earth is out of sight, and yet we know it's not the last we will see of it. And remember another promise of God's word. Behold, I make new heavens and a new earth one day. The speed has built up tremendously. Planets and other stars in space flick by in rapid succession and are soon lost from sight. Soon there's a faint glow directly ahead and it begins to loom up brighter in intensity as Jesus' company approaches. We all know this to be heaven, the home of the Godhead and the angelic host. The heavenly city comes into view and splendour upon splendour radiates as all the redeemed try to comprehend the magnitude of the situation. No, it hasn't been a dream, it's reality. And it's going to be, according to another promise, home for a thousand years to all who have become a friend of Jesus during their previous lifetime. What a friend we have in Jesus, most had sung so many times because they had previously come to know him personally as their Lord and Saviour and coming King. The city is finally reached when all my trials and troubles are o'er. Then shall I stand on that beautiful shore. There are 12 gates and each one has a single door, which is seen to be a giant pearl. All are available to allow the redeemed and heaven's host to enter the city and begin walking the purest streets of gold. We're not told what takes place subsequent to arrival in the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus. There's one thing for certain though, exploration of heaven's city, the New Jerusalem, will provide enough interest over the 1,000 years we will have at our disposal. I go to prepare a place for you was another promise by Jesus, faithfully fulfilled. Heaven was this place, and the mansions or dwelling places were all there, finished to perfection, and awaiting their occupants, the redeemed from all the ages of earth's history. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, the record states. The marriage supper of the Lamb of God had taken place. The 1,000 year reign by the saints had concluded. And there is great excitement in heaven. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, and all its inhabitants prepare to return to planet Earth. The return journey is underway and heaven's king is included in this vast mass of souls. Their king, Jesus, seated on a great white throne, still has some unfinished business to attend to upon reaching the broken down old planet. The adversary now has the numbers following the second resurrection of the ungodly and he musters them in readiness to battle, which is aimed at overtaking the holy city as it begins to alight on planet Earth. But while it is still in the process of settling and under threat, 
God the Father rains down fire from heaven. The ungodly resurrected from all the past ages are consumed with fire. That same fire, all consuming fire, continues to burn until no trace of Earth's history remains. Satan has been cast into the lake of fire. Meanwhile, a new Eden has begun to flourish and the new arrivals begin their own personal building programs. It's evident all have construction skills and immense imagination. The record also touches on another aspect of the new earth. Behold, the tabernacle of God, or Jesus, is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And so life on the new earth has begun, and our new immortal bodies have been programmed to never wear out, leaving an eternity to indulge in a host of varied interests that appeal to each one. Jesus could even involve those interested in space exploration, the chance to visit other worlds, galaxies, etc. After all, what limits do we place on him who brought it all into existence? And the possibilities of space travel, I believe, will be very real. I think for me, though, the pursuit of heavenly music excellence could definitely be high on my list of things to do. While I'm sure an insight and lessons in creation would be at the top of many other lists and so the studies of Jesus' secrets of creation involving life will never be exhausted. Question. How did he create and make work to absolute perfection all the mechanisms associated with all of life? Well, one day he will be able to answer these such questions that today's mankind can't begin to remotely work out. I suspect some could be smiling inwardly at the few possibilities I have touched on in respect of how we're going to fill out some of our time on new planet Earth. Maybe I've got it all wrong. Maybe I've got some of it right. Maybe we'll have to wait and see. Whatever way, life on the new pristine Earth is going to be the most wonderful, never-ending experience and our imagination just simply can't cope with the eternal life reality that will be ours one day. Question again. Possibly the most important question that could enter into the thoughts and minds of many SDA Christians nearing the end of their earthly journey would have to be Am I going to make the grade at Jesus' return? Be resurrected or caught up while still alive to join the great assembly, hovering in space? And at my age, I will most probably require to have to be in a resurrected category. I'm not going to settle for that because if it's not one of these two situations, all is lost for eternity with God never having made any provision for the ungodly or ill-prepared. It's going to be that clear-cut, friends, and it's a terribly sobering thought for all of us here today because all the signs definitely point to this stupendous event taking place in the near future. But surely none of us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians will be caught out or unprepared at the second advent when the trumpet sounds? I sincerely hope not. After all, 
we class ourselves as God's remnant and preach the everlasting gospel in all its entirety. And we can easily identify with the Revelation scripture that states, here are they that who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, naturally incorporating the seventh day Sabbath as the correct day of worship. But in addition to these two major identifying features, this church, I believe, also subscribes to a correct understanding of many other doctrinal truths that are still valid and require to be understood and appreciated. For instance, there is a wonderful truth of the second advent, heaven and a new earth reality. I believe this church promotes exactly according to scripture. And we have already touched on this dramatic end time program. God has clearly put in place for all who seek a future assurance beyond these present few years of life. Yes, the second advent, a beautiful truth we should never take for granted. After all, it culminates in our salvation, does it not? What happens at death? Well, there's a simple biblical answer for the one who is an honest Christian. But how many different versions do you hear at funeral services? We should therefore be thankful and have a clear and concise understanding from God's word on this subject. Then there is the interpretation of prophecy, i.e. Daniel and Revelation principally confirming the past and outlining the future. Another tenet of God's word this church takes on board as an important doctrine for the dramatic days in which we live. The everlasting gospel also includes the significance of the sanctuary service, now transferred and functional in heaven from where the earthly pattern was derived and given to Moses in the wilderness to copy for the children of Israel. Make them a sanctuary that I might dwell among them and Moses did as the Lord commanded. There are also a few other teachings one can ascribe to Seventh-day Adventism. The prophetic gift as evidenced in the writings of E.G. White. The promotion of healthful foods, diet, etc. The importance of clean and unclean foods according to scripture. The ordinance service according to scripture, this do eat and drink the bread of the bread and wine representing my broken body and spilt blood at Calvary for the remission of your sins. And also the washing of one another's feet to make you all equal in my sight and each other's. There is, a, there is a, the literature evangelism outreach Edra for worldwide relief and practical ministry. Hospitals for physical healing. Tele-evangelism for the spiritual needs of many thousands of souls and so on. A fairly comprehensive and impressive array of teachings and outreach ministry being Seventh-day Adventism. I'm sure you would all have to agree. So to carry it further, surely membership of such a church that appears to be able to tick all the right boxes pertaining to the plan of salvation would have to be sufficient claim to the eternal life prize commencing at Jesus' return. Some in this worldwide church actually believe this to be so. For example, to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is to attract the, across the board, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter thou into the joy of the Lord, welcome. We are all looking forward to hearing. So what does the Wanderay congregation say on this very important issue? 
Is there such a guarantee of automatic acceptance of eternal life to those who are faithful Seventh-day Adventist Christians? Well, I'll never know your answers, but at least you'll know my thinking on this life and death subject, eternal life or otherwise. So let me try. Actually, it's all to do with Jesus Christ. Entirely to do with Jesus Christ and our relationship with him. That being on a personal or impersonal basis. So where in God's word do I get the personal notion from? Well, Jesus was in fervent prayer to his father at the time and it was drawing near to his trial. The record states, quote, He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. Then he continues, That he, the Son, should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Now for the criteria. <clears throat> and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Which invites the question, do any in the Wangare Church believe it is possible to attain to eternal life outside of a personal relationship experience with Jesus Christ, the life giver? I think we can say emphatically that outside of a Jesus Christ relationship, there can be no eternal life reward when he returns. Maybe some still feel that Membership of this church and appreciating all that it stands for will be all that is required when God returns. Well, as I repeat, and as I firmly believe, it all hinges on how well we have become acquainted with Jesus Christ because he, and only he, has the keys to eternal life. I either know you or depart from me. I never knew you when he arrives a second time. However, be assured, no one appreciates all that this church stands for and promotes more than I do. But I am also aware that there is another spiritual ingredient that has to override church affiliation. But though the two are a natural merged combination. Only one of the two has a saving element built into it. For it is Jesus Christ who can save to the utmost. Wherefore he is able to save them to the utmost that come unto God by him, according to Paul's letter to the Hebrew Christians. There was no other who had a better understanding of the plan of salvation than did the Apostle Paul. So I think I am on reasonably safe ground when I suggest him to be the champion of God's plan of salvation, only made possible through the life, death, resurrection and priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. For me personally, friends, I am totally confident of the saving power of Jesus Christ to resurrect me one day to life immortal, eternal upon his return. In the meantime, his church and its teachings has an important part to play in my preparation and sharing of what God has seen fit to bless me with. My closing thoughts relate to the future of all Christian people or God's sons and daughters, and stretches way beyond this present life. So let's see if we can apply a little difference to all that it entails. 
Just like the parable of the marriage, where a certain king sent out invitations for his son's big event, sadly, his servants received a poor rep reception. He tried again and mentioned the lavish dinner and how well prepared he was to host his guests. For the second time, he was insulted. They all, all had more important things to attend to, so they said. The third time, he instructed his servants to invite anyone they could find, even to those who were down and out and living rough and in the open. Those who responded were given a wedding garment and the event turned out to be a wonderful success. Likewise, friends, Jesus has invited each one of us here today, along with a multitude of others, to partake of the gift of eternal life. And like the parable, he has even said he would personally come and accompany us to heaven when his father decides the time is right. In the meantime, he has given us instructions as to how we can obtain a wedding garment, which is an absolute necessity for acceptance by the King of Kings Jesus Christ. The secret to obtaining this is getting to personally know the King of Heaven better than we can ever know any other person in this life. Yes, friends, personal prayer is almost the complete answer in this regard. While his word, the scriptures, tell us all about him, Prayer is a secret to getting to know him personally. As such, is an absolute must if we plan to dine with him one day in heaven soon. What say we test our imagination during these few minutes? And in faith, try to capture just a little of what the Godhead has in store for us all at Jesus' return and his program to follow this, the most sublime event of the ages. There is a state of planet Earth at Jesus' return, but we won't try to imagine this because it's going to be much, much too grim. Then there is the situation in heaven where all is silent for half an hour or a week in prophetic time. The seventh seal had been opened and all of heaven had departed for planet Earth. There was silence in heaven for half an hour for all of heaven had departed for planet Earth. How do we imagine an empty heaven? So what about the size and glory of this heavenly assembly? Can we possibly imagine anything more impressive? Well, friends, there could be something even more impressive. Try now to imagine the vast heavenly company plus all the redeemed from all the ages of history parked in the atmosphere above planet Earth in readiness for their journey to heaven. The trumpet is blasted. Can we imagine that sound which awakens the sleeping saints from all their various resting places? And how can we possibly imagine the power of Jesus necessary to resurrect all his saints simultaneously? Now we have to hope. Well, what about our travel through the starry corridors of space to heaven itself? Can we imagine this exciting part of our salvation? We can, but at least try, but we really won't succeed. For it too is beyond our imagination. Now as we near heaven and get our first glimpse of the city four square, sitting on 12 foundations of precious stones, is it humanly possible to imagine how God's word describes such a spectacle? There are 12 gates or four sets of three that give access to the 
heavenly city, and each gate is a giant pearl. All of this too is impossible to imagine, and yet it's promised as reality. And when we enter the city through these giant gates of pearl, is it possible to imagine streets of pure gold, similar to clear glass? And what about the river of life, clear as crystal, and the tree of life bearing 12 different fruits? Try again to imagine such a scene of beauty. Again, we're left with our minds floundering. There is the marriage supper of the Lamb or Jesus Christ. How do we get our thinking and imagination around this magnificent occasion? And can anyone imagine the sounds of beauty associated with heavenly music? Personally, I wouldn't even bother to try. But I would fall well short of heaven's standard of beauty and perfection of sound. I go to prepare a place for you in heaven, Jesus said. Have you ever tried to imagine what such a place could be like in reality? Then after 1,000 years, have you ever tested your imagination about the exciting journey back to our planet Earth, along with Jesus, to continue life once more? In the homes, we will each one build to our own design and satisfaction. Have you ever imagined what interests may appeal to you as you continue eternal life back here on planet Earth in its restored Edenic perfection? I say a big no to succeeding in imagination of what Jesus has in store for our futures. For I hath not seen, nor ear heard, <coughs> regarding God's future plan for all who love him. Therefore, hold fast and keep faithful till I come, is Jesus' personal message to us all as we see his second appearing, drawing ever nearer in this time of global confusion and uncertainty. That's it, friends. We've got a hymn to sing now. It's about when we all get to heaven. Thank you, Mike.
Yes, our dear Heavenly Father, when we all get to heaven, but right now, would you please dismiss us with the blessings of Jesus Christ? I pray in his wondrous name. Amen.